So, good evening and welcome to the Concord Free Public Library. I'm Stefan Bader. I'm the treasurer of the Friends of the Concord Free Public Library, and I'd like to welcome you again to the library and to the 2019 Ruth Ratner Miller Memorial Award for Excellence in American History. Uh, award presentation and speech and reception. Um, the Friends of the Library have been presenting this award for since, two th since 1998, I'm sorry. So this is, we're on our 22nd year and we are happy that the um, award started in honor of Dr. Ruth Ratner Miller um, who believed passionately that understanding history was not merely desirable, but a civic and a religious duty as well. To that end, she was an original member of the Holocaust Commission and a founding trustee of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. After raising four children, she returned to Case Western Reserve University and earned a PhD in education. She went on to serve as health director and director of, of community development for the city of Cleveland in the late 1970s, and then became president of Tower City Center, the developer that renovated Cleveland's terminal tower, marking the beginning of the city's renaissance. She also served as trustee of Cleveland State University, and her many acts of public and private charity prompted some to refer to her as Tikkun Olam, which is Hebrew for repairer of the world. How the world could use such people today. <laughs> um, the Ruth Ratner Miller Award for Excellence in American History was established in 1998 by Richard Miller to honor the life of his mother, Ruth Ratner Miller. So that's the history of the award. <laughs> And uh, on a side note, as since we've been doing this for 22 years now, I'm happy to point out that in 2009, um, 10 years ago, David Herbert Donald was selected as the award recipient. And in that year, between the time that he was selected and accepted the award and the award event, he passed away. And so that year we had a different format and obviously, um, and as it turns out, John Stauffer was one of the three invited guests who gave a memorial address honoring David Herbert Donald at that time, and I'm really thrilled that John Stauffer is here this year in, the, in his own right and not sharing the, the billing with anybody else, so, so we're happy to have you here. Um, but to tell you a little bit more about John, is James Engel, and James is the, or Jim, as I guess he prefers to be called, uh, is the Gurney Professor of English Literature and Professor of Comparative Literature at Harvard University. Jim serves as the Chair of the English Department from 2004 to 2010, also as the Chair of the Honors Degree Program in History and Literature, and as Vice Chairman of the Library <coughs> Faculty Advisory Council along with many other roles during his more than 40 years at Harvard. And I don't know exactly what the Library Faculty Advisory Council did, but it's somehow fitting to me that we are here at a library tonight and that you are here in this library uh, not far from your home these days. So with that, I'm going to welcome Jim Engel and we'll proceed with the program. Thank you. Good evening. John Stauffer is a consummate scholar of American and African American history, a beloved teacher, expert in the art of photography, and a force for justice in the United States. Yet if this introduction paints John as a paragon, that's the wrong impression. <laughs> 
he does have one fault at least. He doesn't know when to cease doing more and better work. If you give him roses, he may not stop to smell them, but rather to arrange and photograph them and then determine if they're an American variety or not. <laughs> the quality of his work and the intensity of his teaching are matched only by the torrid pace of his undertakings. But he does not rush. He does not overlook. The telling detail is always rescued, even if its honesty is perhaps embarrassing. So in Giants, his humane dual study of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, John relates the fact that when former President John Quincy Adams collapsed at his desk in the House of Representatives after <coughs> opposing a vote of gratitude to the generals of the Mexican War and then died two days later, Lincoln continued to ignore Adams and did not say a word in praise or eulogy, but remained instead friendly with the Southern Whig slaveholders. In the Battle Hymn of the Republic, John's treatment of Ralph Chaplin, a songwriter and member of the International Workers of the World is extensive and compelling. It leaves a picture more nuanced, with more shade than other accounts. It's fair-minded when it would have been easy to be overly sympathetic to a young radical or illiberally dismissive of Chaplin's apparent sympathies with conservative thought later in his life. This is a fairly short introduction, so we can't catalog John's six authored and co-authored scholarly books, his five books on photography, prizes from the Gilder Lehrman Institute of American History, and his recognition by the Lincoln Prize, his movie consultations, and his collaborations with women and men, such as Zoe Trod and Benjamin Soskis, his numerous articles in scholarly journals, and his pieces in the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and the Kansas City Star. John has elucidated racial and protest movements in America with a rare and synoptic hand, whether abolition, labor unionization, women's rights, or the fight for religious freedom and toleration. He reveals how dissent is necessary to the successful operation of democracy. A figure he treats so well, Frederick Douglass, stated one aspect of this dissenting and critical spirit that John embodies in Douglass's 1852 speech, What to the Slave, is the 4th of July. Douglass said, I hold that every American citizen has a right to form an opinion of the Constitution and to propagate that opinion and to use all honorable means to make his opinion the prevailing one. All honorable means. So, above these intellectual considerations is the higher one of virtue. John's integrity and example are legend to students who, however green they may be in their knowledge, generally extend exquisite antennae to detect any hypocrisy, show, bluster, or theatricality in a teacher. It's not an understatement to say that John inspires them, and many of his readers too, with a love of what is true and just. The history of this nation is one of high ideals and sometimes low actions of the need to keep in check what Washington called the love of power. From his farewell address, here is Washington on the administration of government. The spirit of encroachment tends to consolidate the powers of all in the department of one. <laughs> 
and thus to create whatever the form of government, a real despotism. A just estimate of that love of power which predominates in the human heart is sufficient to satisfy us of the truth of that position. John's writing, teaching, and life are dedicated in one sense to keeping in check that love of power, exposing its crimes, and showing a hopeful path to a better future. The Concord Free Public Library is a fitting venue for the Ruth Ratner Miller Award, yet it's also true that John is, in a sense, receiving this award at Harper's Ferry or at New Bedford, where Frederick Douglass lived for a while, or in Iowa, Nebraska, or North Dakota, where John grew up, or at Purdue, Yale, or Harvard, or in the state of Jones, a Civil War government of African Americans and whites in a Mississippi county that seceded from the Confederacy. A true story about which John and Sally Jenkins wrote so movingly and which was then made into a major motion picture. Or in Washington, D.C., or cities such as Cleveland, where Ruth Ratner Miller lived and did so much good. All these places and the nation as a whole are to us known better, more truthfully, and with clearer vision through the work, teaching, and exemplary life of John Stauffer. Here he is. Thank you, Stefan, for uh, telling me. Stefan was the one who called and informed me that I won the Miller Award, and I'm immensely honored and humbled. Uh, it has made my year. It's, uh, I love this library. I was here to see most recently the Picturing Emerson exhibition, uh, which is close to my heart, not only because of photography, but because I did a book uh, with Zoe Trod uh, and another scholar on Picturing Frederick Douglass, uh, another a contemporary and actually someone who considered himself a friend of Emerson. I'd like to give a very special thanks, too, to Jim Engel for uh, Almost 20 years he's been a friend and mentor. His writing, teaching, and conversation have been a huge inspiration for me. Uh, you, uh, and uh, his elegant, pellucid style as a writer, as eloquence, as an orator, of which you got a taste of just now, have also been something of a model for me. Jim's uh, illustrated edition of Wordsworth's Prelude came out shortly before my book on picturing Frederick Douglass. He partly inspired it and continues to inspire my interest in photography and visual culture. Uh, his extraordinary range and methods from history and biography to theory and rhetoric, from romanticism to environmentalism, from classicism to higher education in the age of money today, from Coleridge to Thoreau, this breadth, depth, and almost infinite curiosity has really emboldened me to feel that it's okay to write about and teach about multiple fields and disciplines as a scholar and as a teacher. Uh, he's also a past and present and very competitive tennis player, and I've enjoyed playing with him over the past several years more than anyone else. In fact, he's been virtually the only person I've played with now. Uh, he's a great teacher, both on the court and in the classroom. And a particular thanks to my wife, Deborah Cunningham, who is here. We actually met over our shared love of history and literature and teaching. She's director at Primary Source, an uh, organization that essentially teaches teachers with their vision of teaching for global understanding, helping teachers acquire the skills to teach students so they're more aware of the broader world in which uh, they work. And I became interested in primary source and got started because of my interest in giving talks to teachers. And I've always felt that talking, giving talks to K through 12 teachers makes me a better teacher because K through 12 teachers, 
know that if you lose a student for three minutes, they're gone for the hour. <laughs> and it's, uh, we're, we're lucky at Harvard, I can lose students for 15 minutes and they'll still come back. <laughs> and so they've, working with K through 12 teachers have kept me honest. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, she has been uh, an immense uh, muse and friend and partner and wife. I'd like to talk today, uh, I was asked to talk for about 25 minutes, I'd like to talk about uh, history as the activist and the artist's muse. Uh, it reflects um, my long interest in the relationship between the past and the present, even before I was an undergraduate, I had long felt that how we understood and remembered the past uh, greatly influenced and shaped how our attitudes towards uh, the present and the future. Uh, my PhD is in American Studies, which uh, at Yale, and it really united history, literature, and art history, especially photography. I've long loved photography because in part, one of the reasons is that I've always seen photography as the raw material of history in the sense that a photograph freezes an actual moment in time in the past that remains immensely detailed and present. Uh, American studies, part of the interest is that the, uh, the pr approach and methodology of American studies, at least when I was at Yale, was, and it's based on a, really the founding of American studies as an academic discipline, and it was seen as exploring or seeking to recover or uncover a usable past. And that idea of a usable past is even longer than the foundation of American studies. It goes back at least to the, in the United States, the antebellum era. Frederick Douglass uh, in What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, in my view his greatest speech, an absolute masterpiece, said, uh, we have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and future. And if you know that speech, it's a, one of the great Jeremiads uh, in American history, uh, seeking to uh, restore the nation, the culture, to this previous position of uh, greatness in terms of ideals and the possibility uh, of a good society. And throughout history, many if not most writers and historians more broadly have, all, have also recognized the degree to which history has been a kind of muse for uh, readers, for writers, uh, and uh, for historians. Let me give you a few examples in addition to Frederick Douglass uh, in the 20th century and 21st century. Uh, John Dos Passos, who was one of the great early 20th century American novelists in his masterpiece, USA, in the preface to USA, uh, writes that USA is a public library full of old newspapers and dog-eared history books with protests scrawled on the margins in pencil. And I remember when I was a graduate student at Yale, in my first week, I went to the undergraduate library, pulled out a book, actually it was Jim McPherson's book on struggling for equality, and I opened it, and the first page, the very first introduction, their protest scrawled on the margins. <laughs> and I have continued to love seeing that. Uh, Dos Passos is no longer as, as widely known as I think he should be, but USA, the trilogy was a, a book collectively that was more often seen as the great American novel than any other book. The best way to describe it, and actually uh, Edmund Wilson, the great uh, critic, said that the USA is about the decline and fall of the Lincoln Republic. Uh, and it was a book that most recently inspired George Packer's The Unwinding. Many of you are probably familiar with Packer and that novel which won the National Book Award and the, on The Unwinding in a sense is about the decline and fall of the Cold War Republic. Another example and probably my 
also one of my favorites is George Orwell. He's, uh, in the past five to 10 years, 1984 has become uh, a renewed bestseller, according to Amazon and other sites. And my favorite passage in 1984 is, who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. All history was a palimpsest, scraped clean and reinscribed exactly as often as was necessary. In no case would it have been possible once the deed was done to prove that any falsification had taken place. So one source of power for the communist, essentially the totalitarian regime in 1984 is to control history so rigorously that you delete, you incinerate anything that doesn't accord with uh, the party. John Hope Franklin, the great uh, scholar of slavery, African American, in an interview in 1973, said the black scholar has to be like any scholar in his field, but he must also be an advocate for justice and equality so he can be heard as a scholar and survive as a human being. Gerda Lerner, who is often considered the founder of women's history, in her essay, The Necessity of History in the Professional Historian, wrote in 1982, the necessity of history is deeply rooted in personal psychic need and in the human striving for community. None can testify better to this necessity than members of groups who have been denied a usable past. Quite naturally, each of these groups, whether it's Native Americans, African Americans, women, has, as it has moved closer to a position of sharing power with those ruling society, has asserted its claim to the past. And then Arthur Schlesinger Jr., presidential historian to President Kennedy. In the cycles of American history, 1985 to this, today probably is the most widely read book, emphasizes this. Expelled from individual consciousness by the rush of change, history finds its revenge by stamping the collective unconscious with habits, values, expectations, dreams. The dialectic between past and present will continue to shape our lives. W.B. Du Bois, another of my favorite writers, himself a historian, was ke himself keenly aware of historians' efforts to use the past as a means to shape the future. In the last chapter of Black Reconstruction in America, uh, for, in my mind, his second best book after the souls of black folk, he published it in 1935, until Eric Foner's uh, Reconstruction. In fact, Eric Foner acknowledged that he was deeply indebted to Du Bois' Black Reconstruction. In Du Bois' last chapter, he excoriates his fellow historians for ignoring or changing the facts about the Civil War era in order to defend white supremacy and Jim Crow segregation. The treatment of the era reflected what Du Bois called small credit upon American historians as scientists or artists using the results of science, he wrote. And this was at a time in which many historians were imagining themselves as scientists. The war had left terrible wounds that needed to be healed. The South was ashamed because it fought to perpetuate human slavery. The North, he said, was ashamed because it had to call in the black men to save the Union, abolish slavery, and establish democracy. In their efforts to heal these wounds, Du Bois said, historians became activists for the South ignoring the evils of slavery and the humanity of blacks. They deliberately changed the facts of history so that the story would make pleasant reading for white Americans. In the end, he goes on to say, 
Nobody seems to have done wrong and everybody was right. According to historians, Confederate soldiers died fighting for liberty, as Du Bois notes. The purpose for, of history was rather to guide humanity, which is what, uh, Du Bois's quote. The past could be a vital tool for reformers and activists and artists who also sought to guide humanity and recognize that one's understanding of the past informed the present and influenced the future. But historians needed to be honest in acknowledging the sins of the past. All nations reel and stagger on their way, Du Bois said. They make hideous mistakes, they commit frightful wrongs, they do great and beautiful things. All nations, all societies do that. Historians have an obligation to tell the truth about society's vices as well as its virtues, so far as the truth is ascertainable. Only then can people find a way to avoid repeating the sins of the past. Only then can progress occur. Only then can humanity become more humane. Du Bois saw no contradiction or tension between history, activism, and empiricism as long as one told the truth. Telling the truth meant that one needed to be faithful to the sources and avoid cherry picking them, whether out of laziness, inconvenience, or a preconceived argument that aligned with worthy visions for the future. His PhD advisor at Harvard, the historian Albert Bushnell Hart, was the son and grandson of abolitionists, and like Du Bois, was a meticulous researcher and moralist who, according to Du Bois, drummed into his students the sanctity of primary sources and of careful scrutiny of documents. But the historians Du Bois rebuked in Black Reconstruction ignored or distorted the facts while defining their scholarship, at least publicly, as dispassionate. In their rhetoric and tone, they pretended to be uninterested in using the past to shape the future, thus publicly denying their agenda of defending white supremacy and black unfreedom. These historians were some of the most prominent scholars of the era. William Dunning, John Burgess, Ulrich B. Phillips, Frederick Jackson Turner. In Du Bois's reckoning, they resembled the historians in George Orwell's 1984, in which, of his, in which history became a palimpsest, scraped clean and reinscribed exactly as often as was necessary to sustain a closed society, which is how many scholars define the antebellum South and the postbellum South until Reconstruction, a kind of totalitarian state. Activists have long used history as a muse or a means to set the world right, as Du Bois phrased it, in order to realize their vision of a better society. But scholars have only recently acknowledged the intimate links between past and future, between history and activism. For much of the 20th century, Americanists argued that activists were comparatively ignorant of history. In the past decade or so, in fact, one of it is attributable to one of my former graduate students, Zoe Trod. She and other scholars have debunked this long-held myth of American reformers and their movements as a series of fresh starts or new beginnings. Instead, they draw attention to the inspiration and influence that history, whether in the form of books, archives, museums, or monuments have had on activists. Socialists and wobblies, for example, refer to themselves explicitly as the new abolitionists. We're the new abolition movement. Civil rights activists define their movement as the second reconstruction. It's actually the second wave of abolitionists. Abolitionists, Confederates, African Americans, feminists, labor activists, and environmentalists all wrote the first histories of their respective groups and movements. They created a usable past for understanding the present and shaping the future. 
Gerda Lerner explains this phenomenon when she says the necessity of history is deeply rooted in psychic need and in the human striving for community. None can testify better to this necessity than members of groups who have been denied this usable past. Academic historians have often been publicly uncomfortable acknowledging the dialectic between past, present, and future, as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. phrased it, thus and thus their role as activists. And this is one of the things, in my view, that distinguishes history from uh, English or literary historians. They often seem unaware of the long-standing tradition of scholars explicitly linking past and present. For decades, the notion that a scholar's work should be dispassionate was something of a mantra for historians. It was as if dispassionate rhetoric and detached tone reflected a devotion to empirical research and especially to the past solely for its own sake, regardless of how careful the practitioners were in telling the truth about the sources. In their private correspondence in, over the course of the 20th century, a number of eminent scholars sometimes reveal their activist missions and passions, but they did so through their private letters. So Frank Owsley, one of the foremost historian, historians of his era, who was a Southerner and defined himself as a white Southerner, in a letter to his friend and fellow Southerner, Alan Tate, described how he used the rhetoric and tone of detachment to further his activist mission of redeeming the South. And I quote him, the purpose of my life is to undermine by, caref by careful, detached, and he puts these in quotation marks, well-documented, objective writing, the entire Northern myth of anti-slavery and moral uprightness from 1820 to 1876. Owsley's letters betrays an honesty about his activism that is obscured in the dispassionate tone of his presidential address to the Southern Historical Society in 1940. In this influential essay, he argued that the egocentric sectionalism among Northerners and Southerners was the central cause of the Civil War. His evidence for Northern egocentrism is the abolitionists, he characterized them as moral absolutists, and he likened them to totalitarian Nazis and communists. In fact, he writes, as far as I have been able to ascertain, neither Dr. Goebbels nor Stalin's propaganda agents have as yet been able to plume the depths of vulgarity and obscenity reached and maintained by Wendell Phillips, Charles Sumner, and other abolitionists of note. Owsley states this as fact and scholarly interpretation while ignoring the abolitionist devotion to civil rights and human rights and their frequent collaborations with conservative anti-slavery advocates. In another letter among Southerners in 1929, Alan Tate spelled out his activist mission to David Donaldson, a fellow Southerner, Tate outlined a plan for creating what he called a society or an academy of Southern positive reactionaries based on a prototype of the Old South, which is a kind of organic agrarian society that would offer what he envisioned a complete social, philosophical, literary, and economic and religious system. It was a mission aimed at combating corporate capitalism and also of redeeming the South, we should be secretive, Tate emphasized, in our tactics. His blueprint was partly successful. By the middle decades of the 20th century, a potent pro-Southern bias dominated American history and literature scholarship, according to the scholar Hugh Tulloch in his uh, historiography. Southerners were not the only ones to betray a passionate and activist bias in their private letters. In 1946, Kenneth Stamp ranted to his mentor, William Heseltine, about prominent racist, doe-faced Southern historians. 
He writes, James G. Randall is a damned, Negro-hating, abolition-baiting doe-face. I'm sick of the Randalls, Cravens, and other doe-faces, or in, uh, Randalls, Cravens, and other doe-faces who crucify the abolitionists for attacking slavery. If I had lived in the 1850s, I would have been a rabid abolitionist. My only criticism of the radicals is that they weren't radical enough, at least so far as the Southern problem was concerned. Ten years later, Stamp published The Peculiar Institution, and it was the first 20th century history from a white American that overturned the characterization of slavery as a benign institution. Stamp was the first white scholar of the 20th century to rely heavily on the testimony from slaves themselves and ex-slaves. All the uh, previous white historians said you can't trust the evidence from fugitives. You can't trust slave narratives because they're biased. But the evidence from planters, that's objective. <laughs> Seriously. <clears throat> He stamped, re and borrowing from slaves and ex-slaves, ex he recast slavery as a state of war and emphasized the resistance and agency of blacks. He wrote as an activist and he acknowledged his biases. His work inspired a new generation of scholars, including David Brian Davis, who was my, one of my main mentors at Yale and his trilogy, The Problem of Slavery, each one of which won a major award. Scholars' letters often betray not only their biases, but their activism, their desire to link the past to the present and future. Indeed, one could conclude from their correspondence in the, er present, in the early and middle decades of the 20th century that they were still fighting the Civil War, at least ideologically. When E. Merton Coulter published The South During Reconstruction, in 1947, Harry T. Williams bemoaned the glowing reviews of, quote, Coulter's god-awful book. Isn't someone going to have the courage to say it's based on race prejudice and distortion of the sources? John Hope Franklin, the black historian from the University of Chicago I quoted in the epigraph earlier, answered Williams' call by publishing a scathing review of the book in the Journal of Negro History, and knowing at the time that virtually no white historians read the Journal of Negro History, sent 500 reprints to historians all over the country. The response was tremendous. It was only after World War II that the ethos of the idea of the past for its own sake really began to flourish. And it was at a time in which many historians were expected to totally disengage themselves from present day assumptions and concerns to avoid historical anachronisms. In fact, when I was at Yale, some of my friends in the history departments uh, had mentors encourage them to ignore contemporary news and debates because it might influence their deep dive into the past solely for its own sake. In one sense, it was as though the profession was trying to isolate variables in order to study the past like a scientist. Herbert Butterfield's Whig interpretation of history, which was first published in 1931, had, we had argued that history progressed always getting closer to the truth. It really bec doesn't become widely read until the post-war period in which it, when it becomes a staple of uh, post-war reading lists. It was an extraordinary shift from a previous history of historians wanting to reach a broader public, but with an explicit bent. From the founding of the American Historical Association in 1884 until 1995, presidential addresses had emphasized the importance of studying the past in order to understand the present. The shift to analyzing the past for its own sake coincided with the inward turn, according to one scholar in the profession, in which historians abandoned their previous aspirations to write for a general audience. Increasingly, they directed their work to a strictly academic audience, and historians now felt free to say, the public be damned. <laughs> 
according to the scholar Peter, no Peter Novick in his superb book on the discipline of history in the 20th century. Uh, and uh, not surprisingly, from around 1960s through arguably yesterday, the popularity of history as a discipline has declined dramatically. The pressure to study the past for its own sake became so per pervasive that even such prominent activist historians as Arthur Schlesinger Jr., who won two Pulitzer Prizes, served as a presidential advisor to John F. Kennedy, and had always emphasized the degree to which the past and present would shape our futures, he felt compelled to chant with a straight face the mantra that history should be studied only for its own sake. Yet as Schlesinger and most historians from the founding of the profession had recognized history was meaningful to society only when it resonated with the present, serving as a muse for one's vision of the future. Such an approach to the past had energized history and humanities. It's once again, in my view, coming back into vogue. All human beings are practicing historians, Goethe Lerner notes. We live our lives, we tell our stories. It is as natural as breathing. History preserves these stories, making them resonant and relevant. Such resonance can be achieved without sacrificing the craft of doing history. Gerda Lanner, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., John O. Franklin, Richard Hofstetter, W.B. Du Bois, David Brian Davis, and countless other activist historians have recognized. Uh, their scholarly rigor, they understood, needed to be as least as good as that of historians who sought to interpret the past for its own sake. But they also recognized that the very topic an individual chooses to write about, if it's history, arguably even if it's not history, whether they acknowledge it or not, is a decision, if it's circulated, that has social, political, aesthetic, emotional, and spiritual, as well as scholarly and intellectual implications. I'm happy to take in a few questions, comments, or criticisms. Yes. Um, I attended once uh, Howard Zinn. Yes. And I was very impressed by the way he looked at history. Yes. And the way he wrote. Yes. Howard Zinn, I mean, so Howard Zinn is one, in the, one example of how and why more and more people are recognizing the degree to which how we understand the past shapes the present and informs us, inspires us about how to think about the future. Um, I have my own small beef with Zim, but it's irrelevant. But he's, I mean, the very fact that his people's history has become so popular is a, a one right. indication. But I will say, when I was a graduate student at Yale, and this wasn't that long ago, it was in the 90s, mm -hmm. every single graduate student I knew and virtually every professor dis saw Zin, dismissed Zin how, out of hand. Because he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't treating history for its own sake. Huh. Well, actually, he was tying it with, with people's lives. Yes, yeah. and he very self-consciously, he was one of the first. He actually, I think, his greatest contribution was to really change the paradigm of returning us back to a tradition where people appreciate and recognize the degree to which how we understand and interpret the past has profound implications for understanding the present and the future. I think that's his greatest contribution. Yes. Um, you mentioned Reconstruction a number yes. of times. Yes. Oh, what a mess. Um, <laughs> could you say a little more about it, I guess? Yeah, so I'm uh, finishing this. I mean, uh, David Donald was a friend and then I'm finishing the uh, a, a biography of, of uh, Charles Sumner, so I can say a lot about uh, Reconstruction. On the one, I mean, first of all, one way to understand it, it was 
the Civil War doesn't end uh, with Appomattox. If you're African American or a Republican and you're in the former Confederate States, there is still war. It's just guerrilla warfare. Uh, and that continues uh, that continues amid the successes of radical reconstruction. And there were successes from roughly 1868 until about 1873. African Americans controlled their communities in the South. They were mayors, they were chiefs of police, they led local governments. If you look, in fact, I show my students, you look at the, especially the Gulf states, the, the state legislatures of South Carolina and Georgia and Mississippi and Alabama and a few others, when you see the state legislatures of 1868 to 1874, it's 90% African American. The state legislators were African Americans. They controlled the politics in the state. Now, again, not without vicious guerrilla warfare. And then for a variety of reasons, uh, I mean, part of it is Northerners were tired. They were tired of war. Many Northerners, in fact, Grant says in his memoirs, in the beginning, when the epigraph of his memoirs, he dates the Civil War at 1850 with the Fugitive Slave Law. And especially Bostonians, but a lot of Northerners really begin, they, they start seeing the Civil War with the Fugitive Slave Law. So from 1850, to 1876, that's a long war. It's a longer war than our longest war in the 20, right now. We're, we've been at war since 9-11. We've been at war officially longer than any other period in the 20th, 20th, 21st, 20th, 21st century. And a lot of Americans now are tired of war. They just, they want it over. And that was one uh, one issue, one problem. The, another problem has to do with race. One of, the, one of the fascinating aspects of the Civil War was by, in 1865 at Appomattox, uh, most white Northerners, especially Republicans, recognized, rightly recognized, that the only way the North won the war is because of the crucial support of African Americans. Lincoln said that, Grant said that, virtually every general acknowledged that. Wow. And so because of that, white northerners, even if that they'd been very racist before the war, realized the only way the Union was preserved was because of the crucial support of African Americans. So they said, okay, we've got to give them something. We've got to give them citizenship. We've got to give them stuff. And uh, that also uh, is also an aspect for the rise of the civil rights movement in the, in the 1960s. Every major coal, every major political civil rights activist was also a cold warrior. And Harry Truman publicly said civil rights is a crucial part of Cold War policy. Because the communists, and they were communists were in a sense right, saying you think you're a democracy? African Americans in a huge part of your country are a lot worse off than our people at the Gulag, Native Americans. Uh, so in a sense, the, the, the eras in which blacks and whites and Native Americans and whites have been able to come together and for whites to see them really as part of a democratic community has been those periods in which it's a, there's a, a sense of recognizing that they need them. A, um, uh, utilitarian basis, uh, which captures a sense of the depths of the problem of race. Yes. So Brian Stevenson in his book Just Mercy quotes an African American saying to him, Mr. Stevenson, can you please, after 9-11, stop people saying that this was the first instance of domestic terrorism right. because we've lived there forever. Yes, yes. What are Yes, I mean, that's a great, so it's part of my interest in, in being an advisor to films. Um, in my view, uh, in the 20th century, 
most Americans have come to understand themselves and their past from film. Not from history books, but from film. I mean, you all hear from history bo from books, but most Americans, and today including social media. And Birth of a Nation uh, was uh, cast itself as a rigorous work of history. Um, and in fact, Griffiths, who was, I mean, he wrote, he wrote essays saying in the future, when you go to a library, you won't check out books. You'll just get films like Birth of a Nation. And he authenticates it because Woodrow Wilson, who was a white southerner, um, deeply, deeply, not just racist, but hated the idea of uh, democracy that included uh, non-whites. Uh, uh, Griffiths borrows from Woodrow Wilson. In fact, he has title cards, quotes, and he authenticates his film with quotes from Woodrow Wilson's uh, classic work of uh, the Civil War era. Who, and Wilson had been a, an eminent historian at Princeton. Uh, and uh, Gone with the Wind was widely trumpeted as being history. I mean, the uh, one critic with Birth of a Nation said that Birth of a Nation was history written with lightning because it was so powerful, but it was all too true. That was the argument. Uh, and uh, it's, so the, and, his, and filmmakers have been hugely, I mean, they, they shamelessly borrow from scholars and many of them are, ac many of them try to be faithful to the actual uh, sources that they run, but some of them uh, play fast and loose and not only change minor details, but change the larger theme and message of the book on which they're borrowing. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, as my wife and <laughs> Jim and others know, I'm not the most uh, fluent uh, person in the world on digital technology, but I, I can say a few things. One is I think that I think Twitter has been really a detrimental form of public discourse uh, because. <laughs> Uh, because of the pr radical, profound limitations that you have to offer a nuanced statement or nuanced assessment. It's a, it's a genre that's more appropriate for, uh, for agitprop in many respects. And unfortunately, more and more politicians and journalists are using Twitter as a means to communicate with the public. And uh, in fact, the, in my view, the, um, President Obama, in my view, was one of the great presidential orators. Um, the sophistication of his speeches were, were stunning. And in fact, one of his muses, he doesn't acknowledge it as much publicly, but he deeply read Frederick Douglass. He attributed his greatest debt to Lincoln, because everybody loves Lincoln now. Um, whereas if he said, you know, I was hugely influenced and inspired by Douglas, then it's, oh, Frederick Douglass, close friend of John Brown, you're a close friend of uh, Bill, uh, Bill Ayers, uh, <laughs> you know, radical weather underground guy, you are a true radical. So he wants to downplay that, but his, in my view, that Philadelphia speech on race, essentially made, helped him, that was more than any other single factor what made possible his election. It's an extraordinary speech. And if, and I have a, in fact, in thanks partly to Jim, I, in fact, Jim has long taught this course on rhetoric and I've, um, in, inspired by Jim, now teach a regular course on the rhetoric of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. Um, and if you look at the, uh, if you look at classic speeches, I mean, the 19th century is the golden age of oratory. The average speech was two hours. 
people were used to listening to two hours and the nuance and the detail of Douglas's speech or of Lincoln's speeches was extraordinary. You know, Lincoln, and part of Lincoln's brilliance was going from this intense, detailed walkishness to just these gorgeous flights of rhetorical and spiritual elegance. Yeah, it's, that's exactly right. It, and in, in, in a profound way, a democracy depends upon a literate, uh, a literate uh, electorate because it requires literacy to be able to distinguish a statesman from a confidence man, uh, an honest man or woman from a con man or woman. And if one doesn't have that skill, it's very easy to be hoodwinked. Uh, and uh, according to, in fact, I've tracked literacy rates, and literacy rates have declined in in fairly dramatically um, over the course of the 20th and 21st century, in part because of the rise of different media, first with radio, then with television, and some some critics, some scholars have said with the rise of social media and Twitter, the, the long novel, War and Peace, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, the long novel over 400 pages is unread and people don't have the capacity to read it because they're unable to stay with it. And I think that's a, a, a I think that poses a danger to democracy. So on that note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ann Urza Leggett. I am friends of the friends of, uh, uh, president of the Friends of the Public Library. So thank you all for coming, and thank you so much. That was, even though a little bit of a downer of a down note at the end, uh, really wonderful speech, and thank you so much. So thank you, first of all, there, and then this is um, a, the Miller, the sort of official Miller Award. Um, this comes from when this building was built. In 1873, there was an iron fence that uh, surrounded the entire building. And as the building has been uh, expanded and continues to expand to serve this community, the fence was taken down, but we saved these finials so that we can put them into use for um, special occasions such as these. Thank so you. thank you very much. <laughs> reception uh, where we can have book signing and uh, and refreshments in the next room so please join us there you're very welcome thank you so, yeah, if you were there,